Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part two of lecture nine, Negative Responsibility, Moral Integrity. So now we'll shift our focus from Kai Nielsen and his contemporary defense of utilitarianism and his defense of this idea of negative responsibility, and we'll shift our focus to then Bernard Williams, who Kai Nielsen was addressing and trying to refute. Uh, we'll turn our attention to Bernard Williams and his defense in turn of moral integrity uh, and his, his idea that right these two are at odds, ultimately, which I've captured down here. Uh, so we'll see why he thinks that's the case. And that basically, essentially, um, Williams is offering the criticism we talked about in the Mill lecture. You know, the first one that we talked about, the first major one um, that it's at the end, the first of the four at the end, right? The one that, you know, the utilitarianism is cold and calculating. That's basically Bernard Williams' beef is that it's too cold and calculating. It doesn't offer the individuals involved in these moral dilemmas enough uh, credit or respect or consideration. Right? They're just cogs in a, in a machine. They're just variables in this long utility calculation. And that's not good enough, Williams was to suggest. Okay? Who is this one, Bernard Williams guy? Well, I've alluded to him already a few times. Um, I mentioned, I think, in the first part of the lecture, the, the previous video, uh, that my first encounter with him was in uh, Nietzsche class. I've actually taken three graduate classes on Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, and so I've encountered Bernard Williams frequently because he's one of the most well-known, if not the most well-known, uh, Nietzschean scholar. So he's well-known uh, within academic circles, uh, at least with respect to those who are interested in Frederick Nietzsche's thought. Um, and so I, I encountered quite a, quite a few of his articles on Nietzsche. Uh, he's also well known, as I mentioned, the first bullet point on the slide 15 right here. He's, he's also well known for, if you go way back to lecture one, when we went through the history of philosophy and I demarcated sort of what stands out about the contemporary era. And that was that, you know, this gulf emerged in philosophy between the contemporary and the analytic camps or, uh, yes, continental, sorry, not con not contemporary, continental and analytic camps. Uh, and I mentioned at the time that I'm not a big fan of that, um, that schism or that divide. And neither was Williams, I think. And he he's always stood out to me as doing a good job of sort of, um, what's the word, marrying the two camps or synthesizing, I guess, the way I put it in the, the notes here. Um, kind of draws the two together. He... You know, he talks about things that are associated with the continental camp quite a bit, but um, I would almost say he has an analytic style in terms of the way he writes and so on. So uh, for better or worse, uh, in, in my mind, it's, you know, he's a great example of one who can, or how it's possible to just sort of synthesize those two camps, or I guess the other way to say it would be sort of ignore it, right, and and not let it define what you're doing in philosophy, as it seems to do for so many others. I mentioned that other grad student I encountered in the first week I was at KU, and he just wouldn't have anything to do with this book that was associated with the Continental Camp. Okay. Um, you know, I, that's never sat well with me, and again, I don't like this gulf that's emerged. Uh, and so I, Williams has always, you know, uh, appealed to me in the sense that he's, uh, it seems like he helps bridge the gap between these two, uh, competing camps in philosophy. Anyway, moving forward to, so that's Bernard Williams, not that you need to know too much about who the dude was, you need to know what he, what he says, more or less. Um, and now we don't have an associated reading. Um, I, I wish we had something in our textbook um, with Williams, because again, he and Kai Nielsen are going back and forth in the scholarly journals. Um, so we don't have anything, but I will quote, uh, quote what he says here and there. And I think he does a good job, especially I got a long quote here on a, in a few slides where he does a really good job of capturing that idea that, you know, the critics, that utilitarianism is cold and calculating. And so more on that here in a moment. Um, but let's, let's start here, you know, with this idea, right, of negative responsibility and really trying to hammer home this point that it's at odds with what he means by moral integrity. That's really his main issue here. Uh, so remember what negative responsibility is. It's invoked by Kai Nielsen and other like-minded utilitar utilitarians. It's this idea that we are responsible, we're blameworthy if in situations where we could have done something to prevent a much greater evil, we didn't, right? And when we didn't, then we're blameworthy. So the fat man in the cave example, 
if we don't blow that innocent fat man up, then we are blameworthy, right? We have some responsibility for the things we allow to happen when we could have prevented them. Okay, so he wants to home in on that idea, uh, Williams does. And he's worried about um, what this sort of mentality will do to the individual, right? And what it's going to require of individuals, okay? If they're, you know, required to uphold this idea of negative responsibility, and then at times they may be required, you know, for the sake of greater utility to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number, to do something that's completely at odds and truly really appreciate what Williams is getting at here. You have to imagine something that's very near and dear to the person, right? They might have to do something that's completely at odds with that. Uh, and he thinks that that's not necessarily as straightforward as the utilitarian suggests, right? Requiring them to do that, to just completely ignore what matters most to them for the sake of upholding the utility calculation. Um, that's the sort of thing that, that Williams wants us to question, right? Um, you know, that shouldn't sit well with us, he, he wants to suggest. So insofar as they require us to do evil at all, that is the utilitarians and their advocation of the negative responsibility, that we could be required to do a lesser evil, but it's still something we might not want to do, right? So insofar as they require us to do evil at all, Bernard Williams thinks that they violate this idea of moral integrity and require us to, quote, reject conscience and our personal ideals. Okay? That's going to be the, the essence of this criticism. So look, remember how I, I mentioned in the mill, at the end of the mill lecture, when he's addressing the criticism that it's cold and calculating, and he says, no, because if an individual is affected that much, it'll affect the overall calculation, right? If somebody comes suicide and kills themselves as a result of a joke, don't tell the joke. Um, so, you know, Williams says, okay, some of them, they're willing to acknowledge that the individual factors into it, right? Yes, they factor in the individual, but really they're no different than any of the other 5 billion variables, right? So yes, Mill factors them in, but does he factor them in or not? This person is immersed in the dilemma, and yet they are of no more consideration than any other person or sentient creature out there. Williams wants to suggest, shouldn't we afford the individuals involved in these moral dilemmas, and the individuals in general, shouldn't we be affording them a little bit more consideration than just being a mere variable in a long utility calculation? And if, hey, you doing X yield slightly more utility, you have to do it. Even if it means doing something that you're completely against at the deepest level, this is the kind of thing that Williams wants to urge us to fight against, right? This doesn't seem right, Williams was to, su to suggest. Okay. Um, so uh, to some extent, right, granted it's going to factor in the individual to some degree, the utilitarians, right? It's not enough, Williams wants to say. And so at least to some extent, utilitarianism denies the moral significance of the agent's feelings, right? And it's in that sense he says that it alienates the agents from their own moral feelings, right? from what matters most to them. It might require, right, and who knows how many times you'll be involved in these situations, you might be required to, again, completely ignore what matters most to you. And that's what he means by suggesting that it's alienating moral agents from what, from what matters to them, from their own moral feelings. Uh, let's see, so turning to slide 18, you know, he has this idea of moral, whoops, moral integrity, moral means an L. Okay, moral integrity, so he thinks we find, again, this is slide 18, thinks we find utilitarian standards of right and wrong action bothersome or troublesome because they diminish or entirely ignore considerations of personal or moral integrity, right? What matters at the deepest level to these individuals. And so it's in that sense, right, he thinks that they fail to afford individuals enough respect. And I can't emphasize enough to appreciate what he's saying. Imagine that the person, and I'll give you an example here in a moment, that person involved here in upholding negative responsibility has to do something that they're completely against, right? Um, that, that, again, that they feel very strongly about okay, to appreciate what Williams is getting at. Do we want to just go along with the utilitarians and require them to nevertheless ignore their own deep-seated feelings just to uphold a utility calculation? 
And I'm going to argue, I'll give you an example where I think it makes his point even better than his examples, because Williams offers his own examples just like Nielsen does. Um, but his examples are very um, extreme. And I think the examples I give, I'll give you one here in a moment, really illustrate his point even better. Um, because, you know, in instances where the calculation, you know, the difference between doing A and B, and A requires the person to do something that they feel very strongly against, right? If it's only like one more util, do we really want that person, when it's only going to generate one more util, to have to do something they feel very strongly against at the deepest level? It's these kinds of things that, um, that Williams wants to encourage us to at least consider, right? Whereas the utilitarian acts as though it's very straightforward, you know, do whatever promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And at times that's going to require you to blow innocent people up if doing so will save 20 other people from drowning. They act as if it's very straightforward and obvious and Williams will say, well, hold up. And I don't know that it's that straightforward that we always ought to require people to um, ensure the lesser of the evils happens when, again, in ensuring the lesser of the evils happens, they have to do something they feel very strongly against. Uh, where are we here? Yes. Okay. So I mentioned, right, that um, as far as they require us to do any evil at all, right, they would violate this idea of moral integrity and require us to reject our consciousness and our personal, our, our conscience and our personal ideals. Turning to, okay, 18, there we go. To regard, so this is a quote, again, we don't have unfortunately any text that you guys read for this um but this is i want to reiterate this is what uh an art you know an article that williams wrote that then nielsen that we already discussed nielsen's responding to when he writes all that stuff about the fat man in the cave and so on williams writes quote to regard those feelings from a so what the person feels very strongly about at the deepest level to regard those feelings from a purely utilitarian point of view is to lose a sense of one's moral identity, to lose in, one, in the most literal way, one's integrity. So what he means by integrity is just whatever matters to the individual. You know, one's feelings, what they feel strongly about. He uses this term projects a lot. It's just whatever um, engagements the person, you know, takes up, um, commitments, whatever matters to the person. That's what is wrapped up in this idea of their integrity. Okay, And the idea is in upholding negative responsibility is going to divorce the individual from their integrity right from their from their own essence from what matters to them and from their own feelings right it requires them to just ignore that right? and uh, again that's the sense in which he thinks it undermines a sense of moral integrity so he thinks this is turning to oh sorry at the bottom of 18 so when he's characterizing this idea of this notion of like what a commitment is for him he says, we, one can be, this is a quote, quote, one can be committed to such things as a person, a cause, an institution, a career, one's own genius, or the pursuit of danger, right? What, again, whatever happens to matter the individual, that's what he means by this notion of commitment or a project. Um, and the essence of his issue, right, is that these projects and commitments, they can just, we can be required to just completely throw them aside to uphold, right, the utility calculation. And it might be something that we're deeply at odds against. Uh, is it as straightforward as utilitarians suggest that, hey, that's what we ought to do nonetheless? And Williams will say no. So bear with me here. This is uh, slide 19. This is the, uh, the quote I was talking about earlier, where he does a really good job, I think, of capturing the, that sense in which utilitarianism is cold and calculating. Right? The verbiage he uses kind of brings that, that sense about, I think. So he writes, quote, the point is that he is identified with his actions as flowing from projects and attitudes, which in some cases he takes seriously at the deepest level as what his life is about. It is absurd to demand of such a man when the sums come in from the utility network, which the projects of others have in part determined, that he should just step aside from his own project and decision and acknowledge the decision which utility, utilitarian calculation requires. And this is the part where I think it really conjures up that sense that it's cold and calculated, is to make him into a channel 
between the input of everyone's projects, including his own, and an output of optimistic decision. But this is to neglect the extent to which his actions and his decisions have to be seen as the actions and decisions which flow from the projects and attitudes with which he is most closely identified. It is thus, in the most literal sense, an attack on his integrity. That's a very, very famous passage. And again, I think it does a nice job of uh, capturing that sense in which it's, you, you know, utilitarianism is thought to be cold and calculated. Right, we take in these inputs and then we calculate what what would do if we, what would happen if we did X and then you know we do the pro, we do the proper action and we get this certain outputs right it's, it's sort of math it's all about math and plugging in the variables and we're just one variable and so on and um, again it's very off putting for Bernard Williams um, so I mentioned his examples before I forget I should probably go through some, some of these examples that will help point out what he's saying. So I haven't gotten to the hedonistic paradox yet, so I'm gonna leave that part down there. But, so Williams gives these, I mentioned kind of extreme examples, which I don't think demonstrate his point as much. So like he gives this uh, example where this, I think his name is Jim. Uh, no, let me give you the other example. So I think it was George and the job. So George, um, is very much against biological warfare, uh, but he's hard on his luck. He can't find a job. He's got a good degree, um, but he's in a lot of debt. I don't remember exactly how this goes, but it's something along these lines. Um, so again, this is this is Bernard Williams, one of his examples he gives to try to make his point. And so George is this guy's name in this example. Um, he's really smart, got a degree, this degree hates biological warfare, but the only job he can get, and his family's destitute, they're are poor, they have no food, he can't put any food on the on the table, you know, he has a family that depends on him, he can't find any work, as acquaintance he has, says, I can get you a job, you know, but it's involved, it involves developing these biological warfare, which he is, feels very strongly against. And so the dilemma is, you know, should he be required, as the utilitarian says, to just ignore his own personal feelings, right, stop being so squeamish and do whatever promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. The idea being, if he doesn't take the job, his family's gonna suffer, they won't have any food and so on. Um, so the idea is, what I'm suggesting, well, the utilitarian, it's very obvious, right? George has to suck it up and, and take the job. And, you know, to me, that's, you know, it's a pretty extreme example too, right? If you don't take the job, you have no money, are your, is your family gonna die? The other example he gives is Jim and the Indians. So Jim's wandering around, and in this uh, sort of you know jungle, and he comes across all of a sudden this indigenous population where Pedro, this general, is about to execute 20 people um, as a, to make an example because in this village these people have been acting up, and so Pedro was tasked with making an example. You know, took 20 random people out, was about to execute them. Jim wanders along and encounters this, and. Um, Pedro says, oh, to mark the occasion, I will spare everyone if you, if you, stranger, kill one of them. And so here Jim is tasked with either, very much like the fat man example, seems to me, right? Pretty much exactly the same. Kill an innocent person, save the other 20, or not, and then they all die. Because Pedro will then kill them all if, if uh, Jim does not kill one of them. And so, and actually, Williams points out, you know, all the natives that are there, all 20 of them, knowing the situation, they're pleading with him, please kill one of us because then the others will be spared. And so, you know, he brings up these examples. And it's very clear, right? Or he suggests the utilitarians would say, George ought to take the example, or take the job, rather, in the gym ought to, to uh, execute one of the natives. But is it that straightforward? And now to me, in my mind, it's, you know, these aren't very far from the utilitarian examples. They're not going to do much you know, to convince somebody, you know, uh, that's not already convinced, right? What about a less extreme example? Because the utilitarian's gonna say, right, or, you know, how is this any different? Of course you kill the one and save the other 20. So I don't know that that makes um, William's point as good as a, you know, a less extreme example. So the example I always give in class is, and use your imagination, this isn't perfect, right? but I think it'll do the job here. Again, we can do action A or action B, two choices here. So imagine, if you will, um, someone who is a diehard animal rights advocate, doesn't eat meat, at their core feels very strongly against it. Okay? And they have, again, use your imagination here. They have an extended family, 
who's the exact opposite. And sh this person does not get to see the extended family very often, uh, maybe like once every 20 years. The extended family is coming through town, and their only opportunity to meet up is to go to a hamburg hamburger joint, right? And eat at this hamburger joint. Again, use your imagination. So sh the let's say she, the um, the hardcore animal rights defender, defender, let's say, you know, vegetarian, so on. So option A is she sort of sets aside what she feels very strongly against, goes to the restaurant, which she's going to feel um, very strongly against, right? But nevertheless, she wants to see her family and so on. So again, A is she goes, okay, which is going to require her to do something, you know, that she feels deeply against at the deepest level. Right? And let's say that that ends up at 1,000 more unit utils or she doesn't and we're factoring all this stuff in right the extended family really sad they don't get to see her so on and so forth but then she doesn't have to do something she feels very strongly about eat meat or go to a meat restaurant or a hamburger restaurant or whatever let's say that course of action ends up with one thousand okay well is that is straightforward because you know with the the jim the indian example it's like you know how it's twenty thousand let's say each wife is twenty or is a thousand you know, if he if he kills the, the one person, we only have minus one thousand. If he doesn't, we have minus twenty. That's a very extreme difference. Okay, to me, it's much more compelling, Williams, to make your point with this sort of situation. Should we, as the utilitarians suggest, is it that straightforward? Should we feel compelled to force her to go and to do something that she feels very strongly against at the deepest level, when doing so will only promote one extra measly util, right? That is a good example, I think, to make William's point, right? What about these cases where it's not an extreme difference? Why should we require her to, or at least it's not as straightforward as the utilitarian suggest, is it? That she should just automatically set aside those feelings and go to the restaurant. Right? So that's the kind of thing Williams has in mind. Uh, and that's the example I, I was mentioning earlier that I think go, you know, sort of, I don't know, demonstrates his point better than I, I guess I would say his extreme examples do. And for what it's worth, I mean, we can feel the tug at both these camps, right? You know, what Williams is saying does seem like we should respect what matters to these individuals and accept, or not accept, but at the same time, you know, we appreciate that impartiality of the utilitarian, right? I mean, isn't there the sense in which everyone should matter the same? Don't we like that impartial nature and so on? So, I mean, that does seem to be kind of what morality means, treating everyone impartially. But yet, Williams has this good point about um, what if that entails, you know, requiring the person to just ignore what matters to them. The whole point here is that, I mean, both, I think both these camps make good points. And you know, it's, like a, it's like you're in a tug of war and I guess it's up to you to decide who makes the better points. But... You know, when you put it like this, and it's not an extreme example, should we require the person to just stop being so squeamish, suck it up, set aside what matters to you most, and do what promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number? In these instances where it's barely anymore. Anyway, that's that's the kind of idea or the issue that Williams wants to raise here. Turn to slide 20, as we've already been mentioning, the whole issue, right, is these seem to be at odds negative responsibility, moral integrity. We can't respect the integrity of individuals and at the same time require them to be upholding negative responsibility because if doing so is gonna, at least at times, at least in theory, obligate them to ignore their own feelings, their own, what matters to them, and that's their integrity. Uh, the problem lies in that, as Williams says, quote, the doctrine of negative responsibility represents the extreme of impartiality. So he thinks it's too impartial, it's it's in an extreme sense, and abstracts from the identity of the agent. Right? We completely have to remove ourselves completely from who we are, right? and we just become a, a, a variable no different than any other variable. Okay. I want to end by discussing this interesting notion of the hedonistic paradox, which you might have heard before. And there's two related points here. So this is slide 21 and slide 22. Now, I should say slide 21 I don't actually articulate the hedonistic paradox yet. The hedonistic paradox itself is, is mentioned on the next slide, but there's these two points are related to it. So to get to the hedonistic paradox and what he's saying, we first want to mention this first point, which is articulated in slide 21. So the first point is basically he says, 
Um, the hedonists are wrong, right? People like you know Bentham, Mill, uh, Epicurus, they're wrong. Uh, not everything we do is motivated by pleasure. So, for example, the person that's an animal rights advocate, it's not, Williams would say, it's not, it's not like they sat down and they thought, okay, how can I maximize my pleasure the most? I'll pursue animal rights and defend them. Or I'll, def you know, uh, defend a woman's right to abortion or something like that. It wasn't born out of um, this desire of ours to maximize our pleasure. He wants to say, that, no, that's not our motivation. They're wrong. So that's point number one. Okay. So then that's uh, what he said. That's what he's getting at when he says that these projects commit, or commitments, what matters to us, they might, quote, make the person for whom they are worthwhile happy. It does not follow, nor could it possibly be true, that those projects are themselves projects of pursuing happiness. So he points out a lot of times we do become happy in pursuing our projects and what matters to us. But those projects and what matters to us, the impetus for them was not this desire to maximize pleasure. That wasn't what gave birth to us having these uh, projects and commitments. Okay? Even though they might make us happy, that wasn't why we engaged in them in the first place. Okay? So in other words, we might derive happiness from the pursuit of our projects and commitments, but that attempt to become happy, that was not our motivation. That's why, not why we engaged in them in the first place. So obviously that's going to undermine utilitarian theories, you know, these hedonistic utilitarian theories that suggest everything we do is, um, is the result of us pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. No. Okay. So that's point one. Our projects, what matters to us, is not motivated by pleasure. Okay. Now where it's interesting is you want to say, nevertheless, if what, so this is turning to slide 22, and this is capturing the hedonistic paradox. If what you care about is maximizing pleasure, you're nevertheless you own, your only chance to actually maximize pleasure is through pursuing these projects. In other words, indirectly. Because remember, these projects weren't the result of our attempt to maximize pleasure. But he's saying, nevertheless, if you want to maximize pleasure, it has to be indirectly through not focusing on pleasure, but rather pursuing these ulterior projects that weren't born out of this attempt to maximize pleasure. And then and only then can you actually become as happy as you can. Right. Stop thinking about it so much. Stop focusing on it so much. And this is something I've thought a lot about. And no doubt maybe you guys have as well. Um, you know, do we become miserable by thinking too much? Right. Uh, once you this is something I've thought about a lot about, like right? swallowing the philosophical pill. Right. Um, is it a burden and a curse? Right. Uh, maybe it's the case that when you start, you know, doing philosophy, you can't turn it off. Right. And it, um, it's, it's a curse. And maybe it's the same thing with like happiness, right? Um, once we start thinking about it and trying to figure out how we can get it, well, then it's like a curse. We, you know, we become less and less happy. And so the, the idea with the hedonistic paradox is, again, it's the idea that we're best off if we, won't, if we really want to be happy to, to stop thinking about it so much. Um, the, the less we reflect on it and, thinking about, and think about it and directly pursue it, the better off we'll actually be. So uh, what is the hedonistic paradox? I actually try to define as best I can here, right here. It's this idea, right, that pleasure or happiness is maximized or best maximized only when it's not being directly pursued. So when it's not the focus of attention, you want to be as happy as you can be, stop thinking about it so much. Okay. I think that's interesting. Is there something to that? You know, if we want to be as happy as we can be, is it really that, the case that we ought to stop thinking about how we can be as happy as we can be? Or do you want to say, well, that doesn't make any sense. If we want to be happy, we ought to think about what happiness is and how we can be there and what kinds of things we can that, that make us happy and so on. So maybe you want to say, no, that doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, you know, if I want to be happy, I got to think about how to, how to be happy in the best ways to, to become happy. Uh, but there are a lot of people, for what it's worth, that seem to buy into this idea of the hedonistic paradox and this idea that um, you know, fixating on pleasure and becoming happy is, is actually counterproductive and that you're better off if you really want to be happy and experience as much pleasure as possible to not focus on it and to not think about doing that. Uh, and a couple, for what it's worth, famous philosophers, including John Stuart Mill, a utilitarian, seem to, in some sense, endorse this idea of the hedonistic paradox. Aristotle famously suggests, quote, pleasure to be got must be forgot. If you want to feel the pleasure, stop focusing on it so much. And then Mill, John Stuart Mill himself, in his autobiography, I mentioned that autobiography and how good that is a few times. He said, quote, but I now thought this end, one's happiness, 
was only to be attained by not making it the direct end. Those only are happy, I thought, who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness. Aiming thus at something else, they find happiness along the way. Ask yourself whether you are happy and you cease to be so. So here you have a utilitarian, one who says the right thing to do is whatever promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And he seems to be acknowledging, well, maybe the best way to do that is to stop, not necessarily think about it all the time. Right, stop focusing on all the time. All the time. That's interesting, right? Um, so, what would the methodology be for a utilitarian who says the proper thing to do is promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number? Who then, nevertheless, acknowledges the hedonistic paradox and that our best chances of doing whatever promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number is to not think about what promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number, right? And not focus on it. That seems to be the idea here. It's a little quirky, a little interesting. So. That's the idea of the hedonistic paradox. We get a couple related points, right? What is the hedonistic paradox itself? What is it actually? It's the idea that pleasure or happiness can only be maximized if pursued indirectly by not focusing on it, right? And that's paradoxical because we would think that if you want to maximize something, you'd have to think about it and focus on it. Well, no, not when it comes to happiness or pleasure. You're best off not thinking about it and focusing on it. And then you'll actually become as happy or experience as much pleasure as possible. And that, strictly speaking, is the hedonistic paradox. The first point we talked about, right, was the whole idea that the hedonists were wrong. Um, the utilitarians were wrong in suggesting that, that all we do is for the sake of pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. We don't take up our projects and what matters to us. When we defend animal rights, when we go out and defend the death penalty or, or uh, protest against the death penalty, it's not because we think we stand to, to maximize our, our pleasure. So says Williams. Now, of course, the hedonists are just going to flat out say he's wrong. You're wrong. We, we might think, right, we have noble motivations and it's not because we stand to maximize our pleasure. But in fact, when we defend the animal rights, it is because we feel a little bit of pleasure. That's why we do it. That's what the hedonists are going to say. So what do you think? Um, you know, is there something to that? Is, is, uh, what about this hedonistic paradox? Is it true that everything we do is not born out of this desire to maximize pleasure? And is it true that our best chances to maximize pleasure, if that's what matters to us, is to not constantly think about it? That's question two. And then question one is, what do you think of William's criticism? Do you think he's got, he's onto something? And the, the utilitarianism, I mean, we've talked a lot about utilitarianism at this point, so hopefully you, you feel like you've got a pretty good handle of it. Do you, do you share his concern and other critics' concerns that um, utilitarianism fails to appreciate individuals as much as it should so what do you think of his criticism you on board with williams or do you tend to side more with the utilitarians at this point so what are your thoughts in general at this point so we will move on before we get to kant and deontology we'll actually talk about someone who is very reminiscent of kant there's a lot of similarities and that's why um, i choose to address aquinas and natural law theory right before kant because it's the best i think place to sort of put natural law theory in a coin is, is right before we talk about uh, Kant. And so before we get to Kant and turn our attention, you know, and focus to deontology, we're going to do a little bit on natural law theory, talk about um, Aquinas and what he has to say about morality, talk about some similarities between especially him and Kant and especially him and Aristotle. Um, and then moving on to lecture 11, we will talk and focus exclusively then on deontology, uh, Kant. That's going to be a, a very important lecture, very long lecture. Uh, and then we'll wrap up this section or part of the course with lecture 12, where we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about some criticisms of deontology, um, a critique uh, by, by way of William Frank and uh, some of his criticisms of deontology and Kant's version of it, at least. So that's the, the roadmap, if you will, for the rest of you know, this, this part of the course. Um, coming up, right, lectures 10, 11, and 12. So hopefully you enjoyed part two of lecture nine. Until uh, next time with lecture 10, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, enjoy the reading that we have coming up too. Thanks.